Today we're looking at iRobot from Atari, released June 1984 in North America and March 1985 in the UK. It didn't make a big splash at the time for many reasons. A cursed development, terrible business decisions, hardware problems, confounding gameplay, and quite possibly the worst timing imaginable. And yet, despite its initial failure, it's forged itself a legacy over the decades in gaming history as a technical marvel with a large impact on the future. Why is that? Let's find out. iRobot is a game that's cryptic at first. It's not one that can be explained in a single sentence, and that's why you need to read the instructions printed on the cabinet itself. I didn't do that at first either. Yeah, it's an arcade game with a manual. Your goal is to destroy Big Brother, the all-seeing eye. To do so, the robot must change all the blue blocks on the level to red to take down the eye's shields. The catch is, you can't jump when the eye is open because jumping is illegal. If you do, you're getting vaporized. This fact is explained humorously on the attract screen, with the robot asking why and finding out the answer the hard way. The best way to describe this gameplay, I think, is it's a combination of Pac-Man and red light, green light. Maybe a hint of stealth, even. Sounds simple enough, and it is for the first handful of levels. It builds gradually at first. Level two shows that you can jump great distances and how the blocks you'll jump to connect. That things just overall aren't particularly linear, Usually. Some stages do require an exact route. You'll also figure out that you can only shoot straight ahead, as in towards the eye. You can't shoot left or right, so you need to time your jumps between the birds flying. You will of course take a death learning this. Level 3 shows off the 3D graphics. With a tube you need to navigate through to change some reds. This also encourages the player to use the camera adjustment. But oddly this mechanic of having to navigate through an object in 3D space isn't used often. Usually the stage hazards are smaller balls being thrown at you from a distance, or these little pyramid things crawling around that are just annoying. Really, your bullet should be able to kill those triangular absurdities. The only other hazard remotely like this is also used only once. Some giant beach balls on level 5 that roll towards you slowly. Stage 18 has some rings that flip around slowly, but no matter what way I approached them, I was squished every time. They certainly look like you should be able to pass through them, but it doesn't seem possible. iRobot is often credited with being the world's first video game to feature 3D polygonal graphics, and it's not really true, or at least as there's an asterisk next to the statement. Cube Quest from Simutrek came out in December 1983, around six months earlier, which featured real-time 3D graphics over backgrounds played from a laser disc. iRobot may have been in development before it. That's hard to say, and I can't find a definitive answer. It was delayed at least once, and the title screen even still has 1983 on it. Likely its original release year. No matter what happened, Cube Quest did beat it to the market. iRobot can say it's the first game to be entirely rendered in 3D, however. Only polygons and nothing else. Whether it was first or not, the graphics are extremely cool to look at. It looks like a Super FX game, and here it is almost a decade before Star Fox hit the Super NES. Six years before Alpha Waves graced the Atari ST. The simple graphics are used to their benefit. The lack of anti-aliasing does make things look a bit crunchy, even with the softening the CRT gives the visuals. They knew they had to keep things simple, however, and I assume that's why they chose a puzzle game revolving around blocks. Lots of arcade games were set against black backdrops, so just saying it's in space saved trying to make backgrounds or run an unreliable laserdisc player like CubeQuest did. Even the robot as a protagonist was a great calculated move. He can float and move stiff like robots do. Just look at the little jiggy does when completing the level. It's adorable. I found some pages scanned from the design document that was sold at an auction. It shows some drawings planning out the birds, a square chomping head that looks right out of cubivores, and the basic polygon lighting technique. How the dark and light areas would be illuminated. We'll come back around to explore these more, but it was interesting to see how they developed the 3D models. There is some extra bits of gameplay to mix things up from the usual puzzling fare. Every three levels you can enter a sort of bonus stage that takes place inside the eye's pyramid. You try to steal those jewels and reach the end before a buzzsaw cuts the floor out from under you. I call it only a sort of bonus stage because if you die you're thrown right back into space, yet still lose a life. After you beat every level you enter another type of gameplay, the space shooter. It's straightforward for the most part. You move side to side to dodge and shoot hazards. It does mix things up like after level 4 in this phase of gameplay, you face the spike head boss fight. This boss appears every fourth level and fires green spikes when facing you. This is where you will likely meet the first of the so-called unwritten rules. If you fail to shoot even one spike, it will turn around and kill you with nothing you can do. It's an instant death. They require two shots to take down, by the way. 
making it that much easier for one to slip by. Text will appear and proclaim afterwards. Every spike must be shot. Shoot head to make it turn and stop spiking. You can get him to turn around by shooting his cheeks. However, it's a bit inconsistent and sometimes he'll just seemingly turn around anyway. I'm sure plenty of you are already thinking this, and it's for sure difficult to not draw a comparison between him and Andross's form in Star Fox on the Super NES. Big, low-poly face spewing projectiles at you. From here on the difficulty... Ahem... <clears throat> spikes. You see, the game is full of many of these unwritten rules, and are only revealed when you first die to an obstacle. Another one is the tankers. These red and white diamond-shaped things. If you shoot them, they get angry and will kill you. They take seven hits to down, so you don't have much chance of survival. If you don't hit them, they'll just sit there for you to freely go by. This turns the game into very much an experience of trial and error. Even learning these arbitrary rules won't save you much of the time. There is traps galore, sometimes pinning the player into inescapable situations. On more than a few stages, you'll have balls. Mentioned earlier being thrown at you. It can be difficult to register the depths, so it can seem as if you can move forward or back to avoid it, only to still get walloped to take a death. Also, on levels with objects to spawn in waves, it can quickly get overwhelming. Like levels 7 or 11. <laughs> 7 11. Yes, you can shoot them, but they respawn instantly, giving you no real chance to work forward, so it's always treacherous. Remember, the eye is always a hazard, so add that on top of paying attention to everything else. New rules will even just crop up much later, like the tetras you shoot during the space sections for bonus points. Later in the game, when you miss them, they will chase you down too, just like spikes. And on top of all of this, you can't use a credit to continue. It's just right back to the beginning. It would be another year before Gauntlet would come along and make the continue option standard. Well, that is a lie. There actually is a way to continue where you left off from a previous credit. But like many things in this game, it's abstruse. On some levels, there is this little teleporter device over in the corner, just off screen that stays around for a few seconds. There just happens to be one on the first stage. Normally, it will only let you jump a handful of levels. However, if you continue right off a previous credit, it will allow you to jump back to the one you just died on. How would anyone know this? It mentioned on the back of the flyer that you can continue from a credit, but not how, and it's not as if players had access to reading these anyway. It even took some time to stumble upon this online while searching the game. I'll freely admit I used an infinite lives cheat to get through the second half of this game. It saved both time, and more importantly, my sanity. Oh, and also the arcade owner's cabinet. Strange rules do fit thematically, however. If it wasn't apparent enough with the name iRobot coming from Isaac Asimov's dystopian short story collection about robots becoming sentient and the ethics surrounding it. The robot himself you play as is number 1984, after George Orwell's famous novel. And it's the year it came out. In fact, right behind the joystick is the story pasted onto the machine. You are an unhappy interface robot, number 1984, in rebellion against Big Brother and his evil eyes. The evil eye dictates the law. The evil eye will kill you if it sees you breaking the law. Your mission is to destroy the evil eye. The message really couldn't be any more clear. In such a dystopian environment, the rules would be confusing and feel like you're watching out for social landmines. Is this a case of ludonarrative harmony? Maybe, but frustration isn't something people have fun experiencing. And unfortunately, this robot can never escape Big Brother because the game loops into infinity. After you clear level 26, it loops back around to more difficult versions of the stages, along with changing the color palette into some eye-searing shade. Way more enemies and hazards get mixed in, and you'll see new ones, like the birds dropping footballs which seek you out on the ground, and a very unique spiky enemy called a view killer that aims for your camera. If it hits the camera, it's instant death. You'll have to adjust your view with the controls, or you can move to the side. It's like Big Brother can't be defeated and only grows stronger. Yet the little robot perseveres on. You know, thinking about this now, the graphics with its flat boxes and sharp edges one could argue also ties into the dystopian theme it's going with. The sterile vibes often shown off in such works. Everything is only made to be functional, and never for beauty. Okay, maybe I'm looking too far into it. Because the game is beautiful in its early 3D way. One might even say it's all the rage now in certain scenes. Oh, also, the entire game is about taking on an eyeball on a pyramid. So also the Freemasons. I mean, really. There's no way you'd miss this messaging. Returning to the gameplay, of course that timer is ticking to add to the frustration and fleece people of their quarters. So you can't play a patient offensive game, which really is what this game design would naturally promote. 
There's many instances where you're forced to wait, not just for the eye, but for walls to be taken down by the footballs, and there's nothing you can do to help progression but stand there. There is no reason to ask what were they thinking, because it's obvious how the arcade game model worked. The goal was to get more quarters for the owners, that's just the nature of the business, and it was through brutal artificial difficulty usually, and yeah, this type of game design spilled over into home consoles for quite a few years. It really would have been better as a home release, but of course that wasn't feasible at the time. Well, most of the gameplay would have been, actually. But obviously the big gimmick was the fact it's full 3D. There actually was going to be a port, which would have been more like a D-make in reality, to the Atari 2600. But that was cancelled due to both Atari's financial situation and the fact the game flopped. So I'd have to imagine a home adaption of any potential successful arcade game would be on the table. It only made good business sense to do. An amusing story related to that is Atari Age on April Fool's Day 2008 put out a joke ROM that shows a screen saying April Fool's when booted. They even made some convincing box art and have a write-up about how you can use a second joystick to change your view. Now that would have been something to see on the system if possible, but if it did get that home port it could have been something so much more enjoyable. Something in the back of my head kept nagging at me to give it another run. That an understanding would come. So I got some more quarters and dove in for another round. And you know what? It was so. Once you know the rules and their many pitfalls, it's easier to get into a groove and even begin to understand why some choices were made. Like the tankers being added to the space section so you can't just hold down the fire button forever. The gods know I love to do that when possible. The real issue with this mechanic is the draw distance in that due to it your shots can hit something you can't even see when initially firing at times. Another thing I discovered is the balls can be shot, it's just very erratic. Yet with the spike head, I did figure out how to juggle turning him with much more consistency. He still spits them from the side when he feels like it at times. I even learned how to deal with the slippery controls more to align my jumps. Those pyramid things are still just as frustrating to move around however. Man I hate them. Arcade games are meant to be returned to over and over again learning the ropes and making just a bit more progression each time. It's almost meta in nature how they display the rules on screen in bold text upon death. Plenty of other games had these gameplay traps, just not so explicitly in number. Maybe that's why roguelikes made a comeback in recent times. They capture the spirit of it all now that these places are a distant memory, just without costing you the shirt off your back for the privilege of another play. Not that I have the memory. Arcades were basically gone before my time. But just imagine this game being on the Super NES, Amiga, or PC. You could have a manual full of rules, sit back, and try as many times as needed. The frustration would be far less and they could have designed it with less cheap traps or chaotic number of hazards. Would this game have been possible on these exact pieces of hardware? I don't know, I can't say for sure. You get my point, however. They were pushing boundaries at the time on the hardware they could, so this is all just me musing in the end. Another major factor in this failure would be the infamous video game crash of 83 in America. Yeah, seemingly everything was working against this game. They even ended up releasing this right as the market was in the middle of tumbling down from $3.2 billion to just $100 million. The product appears to have been first conceptualized in 1981, based on those design documents from hardware designer David Sherman's collection. Though in this early concept it would be unrecognizable to the game that ended up being shipped. It appears to be a first person game, maybe driving some kind of vehicle and shooting enemies. Possibly an on-rail shooter? Based on the name Ice World, it probably would have been a frozen planet and the fact blue and white colors noted on the sketch that depicts how the polygons would be shaded. Dave Thurer and Rusty Daw would later come on to work as programmers. All these folks worked on a number of big games at Atari such as Tempest, which was an early game to use 3D vector graphics. From there the game began to evolve. A post from Thurer on Usenet elaborates. It started out as a 3D driving game where you went down the road, stopped at shops alongside a road, and went in. Sometimes in the shop there'd be a video game which you could play. But the whole concept required too much time and storage, so we redesigned it as iRobot. Another page mentions a few more elements, most likely some minigame ideas, including rollerball, flying, and quote, other metagames. A game where you drive and play other games? Would it all have been 3D, including the minigames? It would have been quite the undertaking at the time, considering this is brand new technology. Owen Rubin, who did not work on this game, but did work in the same department, commented on this in an email from 1997 that really puts into perspective how far ahead this technology was. It started, if I recall, as a driving game in 3D, but it didn't work well. There was a car in a hilly terrain made out of the polygons. There were some problems making the car clip over the hills. And of course, if you're driving that car, you want to be able to see it at all times. 
And of course, what game do you play? The hardware could never do something like SF Rush or the like. So it would have to be simple. On the other hand, it was real 3D, not the quasi 3D done in today's driving games. This was real polygons being translated and projected in real time. It was quite cool. But even the new hardware gave them great issues. Another first for this game was it being the introduction of the Hall Effect joystick, a more reliable and fully analog stick that Atari would end up making a patent for. Sega would later go on to use for their Saturn and Dreamcast consoles. It's now expired and starting to be used in third-party controllers, but the early test did not go smoothly as Rusty Daw would comment on an interview with CoinUp Space in 2009. We were using the Hall Effect. We had an arcade up in Seattle we were testing and it was playing itself sometimes. Turned out the arcade was next to a scrapyard with a monster crane magnet. It was playing the game from 100 yards away. Turned out the control needed to be separately grounded to the PC board. All the production controls that used the Hall Effect did that after the test. Not sure which arcade, but we kept exchanging controls with them for months and never found the problem until they explained where they were located. Finally, the mechanical group just grounded the shit out of it and it started to work. Yeah, the very environment was working against them and that first run joystick tended to not be reliable. It went out of whack easy and started to drift, but was fixed for later games. And I think this was a full analog joystick, when the regular 8-way would have worked fine for this game. You can't even move diagonally. There does appear to have been issues with the hardware running the game as well. I cannot find a great source on this exact scenario, but have seen more than a few complaints from cabinet owners that it had a life expectancy of like two years. Apparently at the time Atari had this policy of paying their developers bonuses based on the revenue of the sales of the arcade machines without considering the actual time these devs put into making the game. So their bonus got paid entirely based on sales revenue after the manufacturing cost of the machines. As you can imagine, this leaves the engineers with only one goal in mind. Make that machine as cheap as possible to build. These adjustments to make the unit less expensive resulted in a key chip having issues overheating. The game was already delayed too long and had to get out the door so there was no time for further reworking. The solution was to keep trying chips until they found one that appeared to work and shipped the machine with it. If the chip didn't boot, it got thrown out, and another was tested until finding one that worked. If this story is true, that must have been miserable. Oh, also, the cabinet was repurposed from a game called Firefox, based on a Clint Eastwood movie. And no, it wasn't about the browser. The game was a first-person shoot-'em-up with laserdisc backgrounds taken from extra movie footage. The huge bottom is where the player was held, of course, iRobot doesn't use Laserdisc, so the bottom is empty. It fits the sci-fi theme well and is a really unique cabinet. Upon release, it didn't fare well in the arcade with operators or customers. Only between 750 and 1,000 machines were produced. Probably only around half were actually sold. There wasn't too many reviews, but I did manage to track down a couple. First up is a trades magazine called Playmeter. In their December 1st, 1984 issue, it was discussed. In the opinion section stating the graphics are very unusual and extremely colorful, and then blasts it with the following. But somehow it lacks the excitement necessary to make it a top earning game. An average player will not be very interested in iRobot. Atari never should have come out with this game in dedicated form, just as a conversion. Expect to see iRobot as a closeout and conversion in the near future. Ouch. And then gave it a rating of a 2 out of 10, but says it could be a 7 if Atari came out with a conversion kit for an existing cabinet which never seems to have happened. They also mentioned the Doodle City mode was also included in iRobot. I haven't brought it up yet, because I haven't found a great place, but also it's, well, an ungame as they call it on the select screen. It's a mode where you paint using objects from the main game. It's kind of cool as a time waster, nothing remarkable even for the time. As the review mentions, the Doodle City feature is new to a coin-op game, although home computers have had drawing programs for some time. You can go into the main game at any time during it, although you lose a life for every minute you spent painting. I can't imagine many cared about this on the floors. It just isn't a good fit for an arcade, even if it shows off the hardware and 3D models close up. I will admit, it does show pride in the team's work. Electronic Games covered it in their January 1985 issue on page 84. I see what you did there, guys. It starts off calling it the most beautiful arcade game this planet has ever seen, and compares to the graphics to the movie Tron's special effects. Then ask the question, why do I have a feeling in my gut that this game is doomed? For one thing, it's not immediately comprehensible. It looks abstract. The next quote is a bit odd. Its second and far more serious difficulty is ironic, because for all its high-tech geometric graphics, the game is actually a fairly simple shootout. We all know it's not simple, 
And the writer actually goes on to spend multiple paragraphs just explaining the basic gameplay, proving it's not simple. The review finishes on a solemn vibe. Make no mistake, iRobot is a marvel, a game that must be experienced. If nothing else, you'll be able to say you saw the very latest in computer super graphics. If only you could say you played a great game too. Sad, but accurate. But someone did like the cabin enough to cut it out of this magazine page. Like he says, it is a game worth experiencing. So where can you play iRobot nowadays? Well, there is an official way since it was ported in 2022 for the very first time by Digital Eclipse in Atari 50, the anniversary celebration. An extremely well-made collection that presents Atari's game history structured as a timeline you can explore with written and video documentation to provide even more context. It's on all of today's consoles and PC, including the new Atari VCS. So in a roundabout way, iRobot did get that Atari home port all these decades later. Nice. There is another option for those who'd like a remaster. The iRobot project created by John Manfreda, who is the same person who runs Manfreda.org, which documents much of the development of this game. A lot of my info came from there, so please check it out. This is a modern emulator built just for this game that allows it to take full advantage of modern hardware to provide anti-aliasing and widescreen. Note that it does require a copy of the original ROM to function. It also includes the cheats built right in for you to use, so you won't lose your sanity either iRobot is a game you just want to love when you first see it. Even to this day, it's got a unique look, flair, and an interesting bit of world building. You just take one glance and think, damn, that looks cool. But once you insert that quarter and start playing, the sense of awe fades quickly. It's unfortunate it had seemingly everything going against it from internal strife in the baffling way Atari paid their employees, to the very arcade model itself gimping the gameplay and causing an unnecessarily steep learning curve. I know I ripped on it hard in this retrospective, and it's because I want to love it so. And despite all these seemingly endless complaints, I enjoyed it. Legit. It's a very cool experience. It's a historical artifact, but one that was actually ahead of its time to use some overused terminology. But it's actually true in this case. You play it and can witness so many of the pieces that would make up gaming in the third dimension. Camera controls alone took so long for many games to even wrap their head around. And here it is, an iRobot completely functional for its gameplay. And in being so far ahead, it just tries to do and be so many things at once, it ends up confused. But if you give it the time and patience, you can find something really special. Yet despite all those chains holding it back, it lives on as a very interesting piece of gaming history, and one can catch glimpses of its beauty at times. Just after a brief space section, you arrive on level 26, the final stage. Unhappy Interface Robot number 1984 comes in for a landing. It's just the robot, you, and that all-seeing eye, Big Brother. No footballs, no saws, pyramids, nor sharks. The timer ticks. Nothing else pushes you forward but the clock. You jump and get shot. The eye is pulsating faster, you notice. Okay, you time the jump just as the eye begins to close. It's on a rhythm. How silly that wasn't noticed at first. You time your jumps and begin to get a feel for it. A few deaths happen, but it's one's own fault and each time your skills improve. You know why you failed. You jump again, this time with more confidence. Block by block, pulse by pulse, you learn and improve until victory is had. This is iRobot at its finest. Hey there, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like subscribing for more, and even leaving a comment. It really means a lot. This one had some rather unexpected twists. A friend of mine has always been fascinated by this game, so I decided to cover it. Felt like doing a short video, thinking it'd be 10 to 12 minutes. Well, imagine my shock when the development of this game was so interesting and I knew I'd have to double that. It's also a bit difficult writing about such mixed feelings. It's really a game of extremes. Also, I owe a shout out to someone. I made my Patreon recently, just to get ahead of things, not even planning to promote it for quite some time. But one of you out there found it and joined the shoutout tier, so I'm obligated to shout you out, Shotaholic. You are the true OG dude, and thank you so much. If anyone else is somehow interested in joining, the link will be in the description below. Next up, I'm not sure if I'll do the ensuing Pinball or Sonic episode. For Steam Hidden Gems, I still have to try more games. The sad fact is most games out there don't sell for very good reasons. Take care, everyone, and I'll see you all next time.